The summer sun cast its warm glow upon the sprawling wilderness surrounding our summer camp, promising days filled with adventure and camaraderie. Little did I know that the pristine beauty of the woods would soon reveal a chilling secret, an encounter that would forever haunt my memories of that fateful summer. One sunny afternoon, our camp counselors led us on a hike through the dense forest. As we followed the winding trail, the scent of pine and earth filled the air, heightening our sense of adventure. We laughed and chatted our youthful energy propelling us forward. As we ventured deeper into the woods, an unsettling silence had settled over the group. The usual chirping of birds and rustling of leaves had given way to an eerie stillness. A shiver ran down my spine, a foreboding sign that something was amiss. As I scanned the surroundings, my eyes fell upon a figure among the trees. A man, gaunt and disheveled, watching us from a distance. His eyes held a haunted intensity, as if the weight of the world rested upon his shoulders. I couldn't tear my gaze away, a mix of curiosity and trepidation holding me captive. Whispers spread through the group as others noticed the man. A counselor, sensing our unease, tried to downplay the situation, assuring us that it was probably just a hiker passing through. But something in the man's demeanor told a different story, a tale of isolation and secret. As we continued our hike, the man trailed behind, maintaining a safe distance. My heart raced with each step, the feeling of being watched intensifying. The woods, once a sanctuary of adventure, now seemed to hold hidden dangers. Eventually, we reached a clearing where we stopped for a snack break. Nervous laughter filled the air, the unease palpable among the campers. I couldn't shake the feeling that the man was still lurking in the shadows, observing our every move. With a mixture of curiosity, I ventured toward the edge of the clearing, my eyes scanning the tree line. And there amid the foliage, I caught a glimpse of movement, a flash of ragged clothing, swiftly disappearing from sight. The realization sent a chill down my spine. The man was still there, watching and waiting. I hurriedly retreated to the safety of the group. A sense of urgency swelled within me and I knew that we had to inform our counselors about the unsettling encounter. They listened, concern etched across their faces and swiftly made the decision to escort us back to camp, keeping a watchful eye out for the man. The return back was fraught with tension, every rustle in the undergrowth sending our hearts racing. The weight of the man's presence loomed over us, a reminder of what could happen. Back at camp, whispers of the encounter spread like wildfire. Later that night, we gathered around a campfire seeking solace in the familiar warmth and camaraderie. But the image of the man's haunted eyes remained etched in my memory, a reminder of what could happen in places like this. The incident casted a shadow over the remaining days at camp. Though we were assured that measures were taken to ensure that we would be safe, the man lingered in our thoughts, a reminder that even in the sanctuary of nature, darkness can dwell. Fort Bragg, California is a small beach town northwest of Sacramento. It has a kind of Stephen King feel to it. You know what I mean, that misty, almost eerie, small harbor town. But it's beautiful and a huge tourist attraction. You get people from all over the US that travel here. My fiance and I decided to drive up here after I had to take some time off of work due to stress. It was a last minute decision and we packed up our bags in less than 10 minutes, grabbed our dog and took off. If we wouldn't have had our dog with us, I'm pretty sure that I would have lost her. I guess this is where I tell the story, right? It's our second day here right now, and we are staying at a motel that overlooks the ocean. You can see the fog roll in during the early hours of the morning, 
and watch the fishing boats leave the harbor to go get their haul for the day. It really is a beautiful thing to see. We woke up early and I was craving, and I mean craving, eggs and bacon. After getting dressed and deciding what spot to stuff our faces at, we left for our morning adventure. So here's where I made my mistake. I was driving down the road and it looked like the stop that we crawled up to was a four-way stop sign. I guessed wrong, because when I pulled out and cut off a small Ford Ranger with a dinky trailer attached to it and two old men driving, I realized it was a little too late that I had cut them off. They threw up their hands and pointed at me, but Lily didn't even notice it. I threw my hands up in a, sorry I'm just a dumb tourist kind of way, and they just stared me down. It was a hillbilly standoff that George Strait would have been proud of. I didn't think much of it and kept driving down the foggy two-lane road to get breakfast. I didn't even think to say anything to her about it. I never thought that I would see them again, and I didn't want her to complain about me not knowing how to drive. I was wrong though. I was wrong and I'll never forget what happened next. We got back to the motel after a not so great but overly expensive breakfast. We cuddled up and talked about our plans for the future and what we wanted to do in life. But midway through our conversation, she realized that we were out of dog food to feed Bruce. I agreed to going out to the cute but creepy market and grabbing a bag of goodies. I kissed her on the cheek and jumped in the navi. We called our navigator navi. I left and got about halfway to the store before I realized that I had forgotten my wallet on the nightstand. When I pulled back into the parking lot, I saw it. That same Ford Ranger with the janky trailer attached to it. The only difference was that Hank and Boomhauer weren't inside of it. I don't remember seeing them here last night, I thought. I walked up to our door while looking over my shoulder wondering, what are the chances these guys are staying here? And then not uh, two seconds later, my heart started beating faster. Our motel door was open but barely cracked. It was open slightly to the point where you could see a sliver of light but nothing more. I slowly pushed it open and looked inside, but I didn't see anything. Lily and Bruce were both gone. It was like they were never even there. My heart started racing, and I dropped my keys on the floor and ran outside, heart pounding in my chest faster than a jackhammer in New York. I didn't see the creepy old guys from the Ford truck or Lily outside. I was becoming angry and frantic by this point. Come on, where did you guys go? I thought before the screaming inside my head was cut off by the sound of a familiar barking. I heard Bruce barking and I ran. I ran faster than I ever have in my entire 28 years of life. I ran straight over to the front office where the sound was coming from. And that's when I saw her and our dog inside the office. She was crying, sitting on the floor sobbing uncontrollably. And his hair was standing straight up until he saw that it was me sprinting towards them. And Lily got up and ran into my arms. Meanwhile, the clerk is on the phone and I'm wondering, what the heck happened in the two minutes that I was gone? This is what happened, told by her. And it makes my body run cold. It turns out as soon as I left, not 30 seconds went by and those inbred guys knocked on the door. Lily opened it up thinking that it was me for getting my wallet, which I did. And they tried to force their way into the room saying, You can thank your boy toy for what's coming to ya. While grabbing her and covering her mouth. But those guys didn't realize one thing. And that's that, we had a dog in our back seat when I cut them off. Bruce jumped off the bed and didn't hesitate to bite the one grabbing her, and they kicked him, and tried to shake him off but he wouldn't let go. After being bitten, realizing that the noise would draw attention if they didn't leave, they ran off and Lily was able to sprint to the front office and wait for help while Bruce followed suit. I wasn't there and I couldn't protect her. If we would have found a dog sitter and our plans weren't last minute, she could be gone right now. But my dog was there and he did exactly what a good boy 
No the best boy would do. And for that, he truly is my best friend. If he wasn't there, what would have happened? Would she have been taken, killed, or all of the above? The craziest thing is that they haven't been caught yet. We filed all the reports with the local sheriff. I told them what had happened earlier that morning, and the cop looked right at me and said, You're lucky your dog was there. If he wasn't, then they got in there with her. You could have been filing a different report right now. I got tears in my eyes at that. I looked over at Lily and Bruce and thanked God that I had rescued him from the pound. Because in return, he rescued the love of my life when I couldn't. This happened a long time ago. I was around five or six. But it comes up every once in a while at family gatherings. And though it isn't as bone chilling as some of the stories on here, I figure that it fits well enough. For context, I have a very close extended family, as in a huge family that all lives within 30 minutes of each other. We all live in these suburbs of a large city, far enough away that it is generally considered a safe area with neighbors all knowing each other, and car doors are left unlocked in the driveway. When I was young, my grandma used to watch my cousin and I at the same age and she had two dogs. Dog one was Benji, a sweet, lovable dog. Dog two was Cheyenne. She was nice enough, but we always preferred Benji as he was nicer, more playful, and just generally wanted to be around us more. We would always play in the backyard with each other, sometimes with supervision and sometimes not. It was a fenced-in yard, and like I said, a nice enough area. Nothing strange at all. Anyway, one day, we're playing outside as per usual, and Benji is inside with Grandma. Cheyenne was outside but just laying away from us, as we played with our cars or whatever we were messing with that day. We didn't notice until he started talking, but once he speaks, we notice an older man, maybe 50 or something, trying to talk to us through the fence, no more than 20 feet away. He seems nice enough, but hey, I was young, so I had no clue. We kind of walk over to him, but not very close, about six feet from the fence. He's talking to us about God knows what. And this whole time, Cheyenne had started coming over by us and growling lowly. We didn't think much of it and kept talking. I can't remember what the subject of conversation was. All I know is that at one point, he began to try to call us over to him, and to which we wouldn't. We knew that much at least. He was getting upset, and at that point, he started to climb over the fence. I have never been so afraid of a dog in my life. Cheyenne starts going absolutely berserk, as in, if he had gotten over the fence, I don't think Cheyenne would have let him leave the yard alive. He jumps back. And my grandma hears this happening, so she rushes out to the yard and sees the guy, us, and the dog going insane. She starts screaming like I have never heard her scream before, as he runs away and down the road. We ended up being rushed inside where grandma sat us down very nicely and explained the stranger danger thing again. My grandma had no idea who it was. It wasn't a neighbor. The whole time the rest of the day... Cheyenne would not leave our sides. I was always a little scared of Cheyenne after that. I know now that it wasn't fair to her. She was only protecting us. After that, I learned that I will always trust my dogs. We've had dogs as long as I can remember. And I will trust any of them over any person every time. I have no idea what he was planning on doing if he got in the yard. And Cheyenne hadn't been there. So, mister, stay away, and I'm sorry for being cold to you, Cheyenne. Please rest in peace. This occurred in 2017, and it's 100% true. Due to a multitude of factors, including a recent death of a close friend, I was unbearably depressed at this time in my life. 
For that reason, my family flew across the country to visit me in LA where I live, and we thought it would be nice to visit Catalina Island. When we arrived, it became apparent to us that it was the off season. It was late November and the weather was cold and as a result, the island was nearly empty besides locals and a few straggling tourists such as ourselves. My first priority was to ditch our luggage so we could explore the island, so we immediately checked into our motel. Though that word hardly does the place any justice. I call it a motel because all the doors of the rooms exited to the outside, but in actuality, our room was one of 20 to 30 quaint guest house looking buildings, arranged in a sort of horseshoe shape around a walkway, with rooms on either side of the path. The entrance to the motel was essentially one of the points of the horseshoe, and if you walked it dead straight, you would reach the room that we were given. Essentially on the corner before you have to go right to go further into the horseshoe. So from our room, one path led back to the street, the other one further into these secluded maze of rooms. Now stay with me. After a day of exploring and having just finished up dinner, it was time for the cold, dark walk back to the room. Catalina Island is a decent distance from the mainland, and let me just say, it gets dark. Similarly dark was my headspace after the dinner conversation took a left-hand turn, and my overwhelming depression got the best of me. I pulled my black hoodie tighter over my freezing ears and walked ahead of my parents to the hotel room, telling them that I just needed to go to sleep. And I did immediately. Depression sometimes makes that easy. I was already losing consciousness as they had entered after me, Drifting off without so much as a good night. I then woke up to my mom saying my name. A harsh whisper. The room had two beds and my parents' bed was closer to the door and mine was further in the room. My mom's voice cut through the silence again. She sounded concerned for me. I didn't blame her considering my mental state at the time. Groggy, I rolled over her. What? I asked. As my eyes adjusted to the dim moonlight coming in through the curtains, I saw her turn to face me. She was surprised to see me in my bed. Her eyes got wide. If I'm in my bed, who is she talking to? We both looked back to where she was previously looking to see, a hooded figure in all black standing over their bed. Now, I know that you're reading this and knowing a creepy thing is going to happen, but understand how horrifically startling it would be to be on an island in the middle of the ocean and wake up to see a hooded figure looming over you. This moment seemed to last forever. Now, life isn't like movies where characters unleash a blood-curdling scream. Sometimes, the only thing that comes out is something panicked and guttural. My mom's words became low and severe as she said my dad's name in a dire voice that I had never heard her use before. And then the hooded figure did something so bizarre and unsettling. It didn't advance towards us, but instead, it crouched in the corner near where it stood. The way that it crouched was so absolutely unexpected, even in regards to this already unexpected situation, that it terrified me. It seemed animalistic. I knew two things. The hooded figure had been standing over us sleeping, and it's not acting in any sort of way that I can understand. As opposed to the infinite moment of this figure standing over us mere seconds ago, the series of events that unfolded when my hulking, ex-military dad woke up happened in an instant. Suddenly, we were out of the door, not knowing which way the intruder went. My mom was screaming, Get him, get him! My dad was running down one path of the horseshoe, further into the hotel, shouting through sheer adrenaline, I'm going to kill you! I ran down the other path towards the street. When I got there, not a sign of the intruder, but it became suspiciously quiet behind me. I ran back to the room to find my dad, quietly walking back, his head hung low. He gets really close to me and I hear him say, It's a freaking kid. 
The explanation that he said was, it was some young teen who was tall and lengthy as I am in my 20s, wearing all black including a black hoodie, and he had gone into the wrong room, our room. The one time my parents had just so happened to forget to lock the door. My mom woke up when he had entered in, seeing a tall person in a black hoodie. She thought that it was me, assumingly leaving the room in a depressive episode. And when the hooded figure had crouched, that was him realizing his mistake and panicking. He was scared of eyes. As I got back to the room, my mom walked out and hugs this kid, who's now crying his eyes out. I would be too if a massive ex-soldier was sprinting after me with a murder in his eyes.